At number 10, we have Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. And you think space, and where does your mind go? Star Wars or Star Trek? Well, congratulations if it's the former, because a little bit of Star Wars spent a little bit of time in space. Back in 2007, the space shuttle Discovery launched the STS-120 astronaut crew with an iconic prop on board with them. The lightsaber Mark Hamill used as Luke Skywalker back in Star Wars, back in 2007, joined real astronauts in orbit for two whole weeks. An astronaut named Jim Riley said that there is a fine line between science fiction and reality, and the lightsaber served as a neat little link between the two space themes. Just imagine, they said they didn't open it, but if they did, they probably printed like, let's be real, they did. They just open it and they're like, Phew. That's what I would. <laughs> but let's go on to number nine a corned beef sandwich. Now, if you're gonna go on a trip into space, you know it's gonna be a long one. And astronauts, they don't get the best food on board, getting most of their food freeze dried or just nutrients they suck out of a pouch. But astronaut John Young was hoping for something just a little bit tastier. On March 23rd, 1965, John smuggled a corned beef sandwich on Flight Gemini 3. He got the sandwich from fellow astronaut Wally Shearer, who bought it from a Cocoa Beach, Florida deli. Now, because of the low gravity on the flight, it began to disintegrate when John took a bite, but he did say it was pretty good and just if it would hold together, you know? <laughs> All my sandwiches fall apart anyways, sadly. Hmm. Anyways, another thing that made its way into space, at number eight, we have a saxophone. Now, for his birthday in 2007, Thomas Pesquet got a fun musical gift, his own saxophone. But it wasn't an ordinary delivery since Thomas lived on SpaceX's cargo craft at the time. It was delivered on the SpaceX Dragon alongside some French macaroons for his birthday. And yeah, he said he's a little out of practice since he stopped playing while he was training to be an astronaut, but isn't that cool? Once the workday is done, I can imagine that floating in space, you know, could get a little boring after a while. But if you have some smooth, jazzy tunes on a woodwind to keep you going, it'll all be all right, you know? You like jazz? Keep the beam references in. Whew. Okay. At number seven, piece of a plane. When Neil Armstrong went to the moon in 1969, he brought a little piece of a plane with him. And not just any plane too, but a piece of the rudimentary airplane the Wright brothers flew in 1903 when the aircraft came a few feet off the ground. Now, Neil had with him some of the fabric and some of the propeller of the Wright Flyer, and this was as a homage to pioneers that paved the way in aviation and beyond. Which, of course, all makes sense because the Wright brothers Flyer 1 was the first successful heavier than air powered aircraft. And so, you just, you gotta respect those who came along before you, you know? All right, get ready for it. This one's special. At number six, we have dirt. And yeah, okay, obviously it's not just any dirt, but it is dirt. The dirt that did go into space came from the pitcher's mound at Yankee Stadium. And you might be thinking, why, Abby? So basically, Garrett Reisman is not only an astronaut, but also a huge Yankees fan. And he was flying on Space Shuttle Endeavor's STS-123 mission back in 2008, and astronauts are allowed to bring mementos, so he thought, hey, why not bring up a little bit of dirt from the stadium of my favorite team? And it seems worth it when you find out he also threw the first ceremonial first pitch from space in microgravity. So the man's dedicated and he's gonna go down in history, so. Seems good to me. Now, the next one hasn't just traveled into space, but it has stayed there. At number five is the fallen astronaut. Now, not all people who went to the moon made it back safely. It is a risky job to be an astronaut after all. So now, resting on the moon is a small aluminum figurine by Belgian artist Paul van Hoedonck. It is stylized to try to depict an astronaut in a spacesuit as a way to commemorate those who have passed in the advancement of space exploration. It was put on the moon in 1971 next to a plaque listing 14 American and Soviet men who were known to have died at that point. This was organized by astronaut David Scott before his Apollo 15 lunar mission. And now it serves as a nice tribute to all those who give their life to space. And now, People haven't been the only mammals to not make it through a space mission, which brings me to number four. Lots of dead space monkeys, many called Albert. Now, before people were sent into space, animals were used to test the waters, or the space. Now, in the US, monkeys or chimpanzees were used for this, and many were named Albert. After the first one they named Albert, they just decided to keep that name going. In some cases, when the apes passed away, the spacecrafts weren't reported as recovered, which has led people to believe that there may be some space junk out there with some monkeys still in them. Now, not all space places used monkeys back then. During the space race, the Soviets were using dogs to see how the atmosphere would affect creatures, which obviously sparked many heated debates on animal testing, but they don't do that anymore, so. 
Now let's move on to a lighter note, sports! At number three we have a golf ball. On the Apollo 14 trip, Alan Shepard decided to bring a couple of golf balls with him on his trip to the moon. He decided, hey I'll take a few shots on the moon, so he attached a modified 8 iron club head to the end of a device that traditionally collects samples of moon dust, and then he just let her rip. Now video footage shows that he missed the mark a few times and hit the ground before hitting the ball, but Come on, can we really blame the guy? Gravity is different on the moon, so you have to give a guy some time to adjust, right? He sent one 200 yards, which, you know, isn't too bad, but then he sent another one for what he said went on for miles and miles. So one scientist did the math and said Alan was right. With the right hit, a golf ball could be sent about two and a half miles. So at that point, that's quite a bit more than the world record of 515 yards, and I just want to say, Dad, can you do better than that? <laughs> Just kidding, love you dad. Okay, bye. Let's move on to number two, Buzz Lightyear toy. I mean action figure, whatever you call it, okay? So to infinity and beyond, and to infinity and beyond good old Buzz Lightyear went. Back in 2008, an action figurine of the Toy Story astronaut hopped aboard the International Space Station with the Discovery Mission STS-124. He had a jolly old time, possibly missing some other toys to hang out with, but returned 15 months later on STS-128. So now, before Lightyear went on his journey, he was even given the all clear to go by the other Buzz astronaut, Buzz Aldrin. In a promo video for NASA, Buzz Aldrin even told Buzz Lightyear that he, Buzz Aldrin, was the real Buzz. And yes, it's it's true. Buzz Lightyear's name was inspired by Buzz Aldrin, so this second man to step out on the moon has a legacy more than the moon, also Buzz Lightyear. Toy Story. Yes. But let's finish up with number one, tardigrades or water bears. So if you're wondering what these things are, haven't heard it through the grapevine, let me break it down for you. Tardigrades are very tiny, yet microscopic, eight-legged creatures that are known to survive extreme temperatures. They can withstand being heated to 150 degrees Celsius and frozen to almost absolute zero. So knowing this, scientists did experiments with tardigrades and found out that some could withstand being in the vacuum of space. And this is because they can be brought back to life decades after being dehydrated, or it's at least possibly connected to that. So right now, there are some of these tardigrades, aka water bears, aka moss piglets on the moon. Now this is since an Israeli spacecraft crash landed on the moon this April. Also, some people think they are still alive, so maybe they'll be the first inhabitants on the moon. That'd be kinda cool, little, little bears. Microscopic, but yeah. Now, number 10, a Pluto slug. Some people say Pluto isn't a planet, or just a main planet anymore, just a dwarf planet. And to that, I say, no, no, Pluto is a real planet in my heart, okay? Anyways, onto what really matters. In 2016, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft got some nice pics of an icy region on Pluto's surface. If you look at the picture, there's like a little black formation in the center, and behind it is a trail. So it looks like a little slug has been making its way across the icy terrain, carving its own little path, making its way through this just desolate space. No, okay, I'm not crying because it's actually a slug, because it probably isn't. The scientists are saying it's likely a dirty block of water ice floating in a denser solid of nitrogen, so not a slug, but like it looks like it. It still is a mystery on what exactly it is, because that's more a hypothesis, you could say, but it's probably not a slug. But it doesn't stop me from thinking, like doesn't that sound like a nice children's book or something? The slug on Pluto, it'd be so cute. Like, that's all I'm thinking. On to number nine, the Mars spoon? Question mark? So this is a much, much closer planet than Pluto, who is Still a planet in my heart. So this is Mars. So on a photo captured by the beloved NASA Curiosity rover, you can see what looks like a spoon, possibly? Like, it looks like a spoon, honestly. There's a handle, check. Mini concave element on the end of the handle, also check. Yes, it just looks like it's covered in dust because it's on the surface of Mars, which is, you know, a red, dusty planet, but Spoon, nonetheless. This was spotted by a YouTube user called UFO Hunter, which led to more people kind of agreeing and being like, yeah, it looks kind of like a spoon. From then on, more people were questioning just like, yo, where'd this spoon come from? Was a Martian eating an ice cream sundae before an entire Martian race was just wiped out? And so that's kind of what UFO Hunter was thinking, saying it may be left over from a lost civilization, but we could just be projecting our ideas onto a clump of space dust, honestly. What if, what if it's one of those things where you just touch it and it crumbles? Could be. I don't know. At number eight, fish rock. Is this another thing we could just be projecting? This fish looking thing spotted on Mars is probably just a rock, but we gotta remember, Mars once had an ocean even bigger than the Arctic Ocean. And even if it could be a rock, it probably is a rock. Look at the similarities to a fish. An upturned nose, a fin, and even a finned tail too. Have I ever caught a fish? No, and have I tried? Yes, but if I did catch one. 
I bet it would look like this, and I bet it would also be a rock that I was trying to convince people was a fish, but let's move on to number seven, face on Jupiter. So yes, let's hop on over to another planet, our big one in our solar system, the big old gas giant, Jupiter. And now this image shows what looks like a derpy looking face on the gas giant. It even has a lovely name. Wait for it. Jovi McJupiter face. Very nice, very cute. So this face was awarded that beautiful name by Jason Major, a citizen scientist who rotated a photo that NASA took. Now NASA's Juno spacecraft sent down an unaltered photo and Major was like, no, 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 no. Let's interpret these two storms as eyes and the wider swirling red part as a mouth, which is genius. Now Jovi McJupiter face obviously shows we can see the beauty in our in anything in nature and life. So now the next section that we're gonna be talking about is staying within the realm of our solar system, but going in a little closer, a little smaller. So let's take a peek at the moons we have. So at number six, we have Ravioli Moon. This delectable little treat of a moon is one of Saturn's moons. Its name is Pan, and yes, it looks like a little treat of ravioli. And ravioli gets tossed in a pan with butter oil, right? Does that blend the two names together enough for you? Connections. Fun. Anyways, the reason it looks like the pasta is because material from Saturn's rings falls onto Pan's equator, and the buildup results in the really unique buildup on the equator that makes me think, you know, ravioli. But maybe if you don't have food on the brain, you may think Pan looks more like a flying saucer. And in that case, right on. But for me, ravioli. On to number five, Death Star Moon. The second and last of our honorable moon mentions is Mimus, or Mimus, AKA the Death Star Moon. Now this is another of Saturn's many moons and this one garners a few more eyes because of its similarities to the Death Star from Star Wars. And you know, the big dish on the Death Star, boom, big crater on Mimas. Is this really the Death Star in disguise? Probably not since it's been orbiting Saturn for a bit. Plus that idea was mainly for a fictional universe. Also mainly, this moon is really big. So Mimas is 396 kilometers in diameter and the first Death Star and second Death Star were both between 160 and 140 kilometers in diameter. So if you're thinking, yeah, but what about the third Death Star? Well, that one's too big, measuring about 900 kilometers in diameter, so it's not that one either. So it's not the Death Star in disguise, so you can, you know, exhale and breathe a little bit. But it is a cool looking moon, so. Yep. Okay, so next up is not only out of this world, but also out of this solar system. The next three we have are nebulas, which if you don't know, are super cool on their own, even if they don't look like anything in particular, but these next three have the added X factor of looking just really cool. At number four, we have Horsehead Nebula. So this first nebula we're looking at was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope back in 2013. The stunning nebula got the nickname Horsehead Nebula because of its looks. Think back to cloud watching when you were younger and seeing the shapes in them, and you can see that this nebula looks like the head and neck of a horse in this image with the nose of the horse facing the left. And unfortunately, we can't pay this little horsey a visit because it's about 1,500 light years away from the Orion constellation. And for reference, Orion's constellation is 243 to 1,360 light years away from us, so a little ways away. But you can still admire it for its beautiful looks. This next one, number three, is Space Crab. And so this one is quite a ways further. It's about 6,500 light years away from Earth, and it's the Crab Nebula. Now, let's look a bit more at this five-layered composite image of this bad boy. So the composite image, it, it looks like something out of a movie. One, stunning. And then again, two, the colors, magnificent, such range. Do I sound like I'm impersonating Jonathan Van Ness? Yes. It looks like an artist made it. It's beautiful. And yes, this nebula is called the Crab Nebula, because the range of its legs, so it said. But others have also compared these outstretchings to an octopus's tentacles. And so if you're having a hard time seeing these legs or arms that I'm talking about, look mainly at the pink sections and a little bit at the yellow. And I find it helps you paint a picture of what you're looking at. I am the nebula. On to another nebula, the Twin Jet Nebula, also known as a space butterfly. So this cosmic butterfly looking thing is actually a two-lobed nebula. It has the official name PNM2-9 and it was originally spotted back in 1947. It's more commonly known as the Twin Jet Nebula because really it looks like two jets coming out of the back of a rocket ship colliding into one another and then the blasts radiating outwards. I feel like you could even argue it's two pop bottles head to head shrouded in like a green atmosphere. But then if you look right in the center, I say it looks like a fairy from Legend of Zelda, which looks a bit like a butterfly. So that's where you get the name Cosmic Butterfly Mystery Solved. The Twin Jet Nebula is obviously a fairy from Legend of Zelda. You're welcome. So our number one is the D&D &D asteroid. And obviously this one is my number one because I am a gamer, a tabletop role-playing gamer, that is. Asteroid 2017 BQ6 has been compared to dice used in playing Dungeons and Dragons and also other tabletop games because of its angular shape. And you kind of have to know that this is 
This is kind of odd because most planets and stuff around space is rounded. It kind of looks like a bunch of either spheres or just potatoes passing through. And so this asteroid passed from a distance of about 1.6 million miles away, but it didn't, you know, land anywhere. Like, dice usually do. And like, if you think about it, there's already enough people thinking we are living in a simulation. But guys, what if we live in a game? One of their dice in the great unknown fell into space and now they're laughing at us because we rolled a natural one on perception. A simulation game. You're thinking the sims I'm thinking. They're just dictating each of our lives with dice rolls. It's all up to random. Who knows? In our number 10 spot, we have The Gray Thing. This is a story told by an anonymous online user that claims to be an astronaut who once saw an alien in an underground US base. Take it with a grain of salt, but I wanted to include it because the story was super interesting to read. He claimed to have been traveling through a US base that he didn't want to name as there is only a number of people allowed in and he doesn't want to be tracked. Anyways, at this space, he saw a gray person that was quite definitely not from this planet. Also when out in space, he had seen a fleet of aircraft that he knew were UFOs, but he didn't think we had any contact with them yet. It wasn't until that moment that he realized that not only do we have contact with them, the aliens are actually already living among us. Interesting. Well, there are so many quote unquote whistleblowers that have mentioned gray people, so this story could be true. What do you think? In our number 9 spot, we have the flying saucer. Astronaut Deke Slayton revealed in an interview in 1951 that he had seen UFOs. Technically not in space, but obviously the UFO would have come from space, so I wanted to include this one. He said that he was testing a P-51 fighter and flying at about 10,000 feet in Minneapolis when he spotted something strange in the distance. It was grey and kind of looked like a kite, but a kite wouldn't be flying this high, he thought. As he got closer, he saw that it was like a saucer, a disc. He eventually realized that it was starting to move away from him, and then as quick as a blink, it pulled about a 45 degree climbing turn, and then accelerated and disappeared. You can see why I wanted to include this one. In our number 8 spot, we have UFO in orbit. Astronauts James Lavelle and Frank Borman have claimed to have seen a UFO during the second orbit on the Gemini. There have been many skeptics around this claim, and they usually say that it was probably the Titan booster rocket that was at its final stage. However, Lavelle has replied to this claim, saying that he could also see the booster rocket nearby when he saw the UFO. The exchange initially reported went as follows. Lavelle. Bogey at 10 o'clock high, NASA employee. This is Houston, say again, Seven. Lavelle, said we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high, NASA employee. Gemini 7, is that the booster or is that an actual sighting? Lavelle, we have several actual sighting. NASA employee, estimated distance or size? Lavelle, we also have the booster in sight. Ooh, well, I don't know how the skeptics got around that, but skeptics are pretty committed to believing their own narrative about life in the universe, so oh well, let's let them stay in their boring world. In our number 7 spot, we have enormous babies. There have been many reports from NASA employees of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin seeing aliens when they first arrived on the moon. Even though Buzz and Neil deny it, I'm sure they have been told to deny it, if you know what I mean. A former NASA employee by the name of Otto Binder bypassed NASA's broadcasting and picked up the following being said. NASA, what's there Apollo 11? Response, these babies are huge sir, enormous, oh my god, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there, lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Apparently off the record, the astronauts have admitted to many scientists that they did indeed see something. Yeah, I believe it. It's silly to think that there is nothing out there. That's just, you know, human ego, I think, to believe that we are the only intelligent life. That mixed with human fear. In our number six spot, we have the lights. Of course, I couldn't have a list without the strange space light phenomena on it. An entire crew at the International Space Station in 2005 witnessed a set of strange lights projecting across space. Commander Leroy Chow has commented on this strange sighting and said that the light was in a weird formation as if it were an upside down V shape. The crew and Chow saw this fleet of lights in the shape of an upside down V fly past them. It would be one thing if it were just one person, but an entire crew witnessed this. That's a lot of people that 
would be lying. So personally, I think that's all the proof we need, folks. There is other intelligent life out there, and they may be close by. Perhaps they're already here and running our government. You decide. In our number five spot, we have alien interaction. This one needed to be included on the list because it's really just suspicious. Very sus. Apparently, Scott Kelly, a well-known astronaut and most notably known for spending a very, very long time on the International Space Station, the longest an astronaut has ever spent there, actually. But anyways, Scott has been known to make quite a few jokes about the things he's seen out there, and we have to wonder, are they really jokes, or was he told not to speak his truth? He was quoted as once saying that aliens have it easier in space than we do. First off, someone's gotta teach this man what a joke is, cause it's missing a punchline. And second, what does that mean? What makes you say something like that? There must be some weird truth behind it. Anyways, I'm convinced that he's seen aliens. What about you? Let me know in the comment section below. In our number four spot, we have a fleet of UFOs. Allegedly, astronaut Gordon Cooper is another one who has reported seeing UFOs in space. If you haven't heard of Gordon Cooper before, then you should know that he flew both the Mercury 9 and the Gemini 5, so he's really had quite a lot of time in outer space. Apparently, he is now coming out and saying that around the time he flew for the Air Force, he saw a fleet of UFOs. Apparently, not more than 10 years later, he came across a similar scene. Allegedly, in 1963, one of them flew towards him, and to back up his statement, he has proof because it was picked up by the radar. Whoa. Also, what would be his reasoning for making this up? to gain fame? Nah. Well, I mean, it's possible, but he would have already gained some clout just by being an astronaut in space, so I feel like that's probably not likely, but anyways, I believe him. He's gone on to say that, quote, I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet and other planets. Most astronauts were reluctant to discuss UFOs. I did have occasion in 1951 to have two days of observation of many flights of them, of different sizes, flying in fighter, formation generally from east to west over Europe. Fascinating. In our number three spot, we have the cylindrical object. Allegedly in 1991, a cosmonaut by the name of Musa Menarov caught a cylindrical object on film that he believed to be a UFO. The object was shiny and in the film, it swivels and flies across space. Originally, Musa thought it was something off the ship, but then after further investigation, nothing was missing from the ship. So after further reflection on seeing it and you know looking back at the footage, he's convinced it was some kind of UFO ship or a UFO device. What's with all the UFO objects that are so shiny? Do you think this is a UFO? Or perhaps is it something from another planet? Let us know in the comment section below. Coming up in our number two spot, we have the mystery hut. The ending to this made me lol so hard that I had to include it. A mystery hut was discovered by China's astronauts and people operating their U-2-2 moon rover. This rover was making its way through the northwestern part of the moon when it was discovered. On the camera, a cute shaped mystery hut was captured. This was only in November of 2021. It created a spectacle. Had moon people finally been discovered? Everyone was asking themselves. By January 2022, the rover was much closer. And what did it find? Oh, just a small piece of space rock on a crater rim. <laughs> The drama. Ooh, look, a mystery hut. Probably the moon men reside there. One month later. Alas, it is a rock. Humans are funny. <laughs> in our number one spot, we have UFO footage. Recently in 2020, Russian astronaut, cosmonaut Ivan Wagner made a time-lapse video while orbiting space, and he claimed to have found something. Space guests he called them. In his video, you see the curved edge of the Earth at night with a green swirl of the aura moving across the surface and several falling stars. It's such a cool video to see. Then, about nine seconds in, you see a fleet of five possible UFOs. He said that because it's in a time-lapse format. You can't measure how long they were there, but in real life, it was for about 50 seconds in real life time. This video is so crazy. Honestly, even if it's not alien fleet, to see such a beautiful sight with the falling stars is just unreal. It must be incredible to be an astronaut. <laughs>